Sanctify unto Molech all the firstborn, whatso openeth among the womb, among the children of Moab, both of man and of beast. It is mine. Interesting uh, uh, discovery of. Uh, Israeli archaeology, they found unambiguous proof that the Moabites were practicing human sacrifice in the land of Israel. Interesting uh, find, right, Ariel? I'd say so. Unambiguous, the sacrifice, human, all the Canaanites, they were committing human sacrifice. That's why God destroyed them, right? I mean, maybe. I don't know. That's what people tell me. Okay, well, I guess this gimmick is kind of outlived its very, very short welcome. Um, the reality is, um, this is actually not a text uh, from any sort of Moabite inscription. Actually, this is from the book of Exodus in the Torah, Exodus 3, 1 and 3, 2. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. So, I wonder how many people in the audience in this not live stream were immediately taken in by the notion of, oh, wow, this is proof that the... Moabites uh, practice human sacrifice, but as soon as I turned it around and made it clear that who it is actually written about, suddenly the apologists come out and say, oh, uh, uh, consecrate. In this context, consecrate means to devote to God as sort of like, uh, as, as, you know, you know, follower. And I was like, you know, he's not going to actually be, blah, blah, blah. no, he's, it's, it's rather that uh, he's not going to be sacrificed. He's just going to be devoted to Yahweh. And, and then the, in numbers, you know, the, the tribe of Levi was given this responsibility as the firstborn tribe of Israel. They're now given to God so that they serve him. I mean, to be fair, the word that is used, Kadesh, just means to sanctify, set apart. Probably the way that I would interpret this is not that different from the idea of how, um, how was it, um, young women in Rome were dedicated from a young age to be vestal virgins. And in that case, they part of their service was that they weren't allowed to have any sexual intercourse or sexual contact. And that part of their remaining pure was the protection of Rome. And so if Rome was like under attack and you know something bad happened then it was the vestal virgins to blame and yes. so w w within this context and um you definitely you definitely have references where people are sacrificing to the god of the hebrew bible but uh maybe sacrificing you know humans but this i think this is too ambiguous to um to say that it is one of them and in fact i think this is actually probably evidence that going reverse that some of these ideas of mate um of like passing children through the fire or um like offering up children to a god in non-israelite context might have actually originally just referred to this idea of giving your child essentially up to that god as a parent to then serve in their temple yes or or to devote in some other way Example being Car in Carthage, you know, Han Hannibal having to pass his hand through a flame to swear vengeance against Rome uh, in front of the, the god Baal Hamon. And it's interesting um, because this, this arises from perhaps a misunderstanding or an intentional misunderstanding around sacrifice. 
And I wanted to tackle this idea of, of sacrifice, human sacrifice, the idea of sacrifice in general, historiography of human sacrifice, the necessities of sacrificing humans as a sort of a way of, you know, addressing some social issues, both in antiquity and today, because that's what my channel is all about. That's my channel. So what we do we get these ambiguous references to sacrifice that are taken as unambiguous proof, not just by hobbyists, not just by ideologues, but mainstream archaeologists in the Carthaginian context. They are so eager to find this idea of proof that the Carthaginians and the Canaanites in general practice human sacrifice, that they are having a much lower standard of proof compared to looking at God's chosen uh, sheep herds, you know, the Israelites. You're muted. Let me unmute you. Ah, ah, I've been cursed by muteness by the gods, but I have been cured. I guess I am the Messiah. I thought oh, that no. was a very naughty boy. Honestly, I think it was Elion, but you know, you did help remind me that I was muted, so I will give you partial credit. I think I technically unmuted you. I don't remember though. Oh no, no, no! I you said it, and then I unmuted myself. So ultimately, I, I actually pressed no. the little dingly button. Anyway, oh, anyway. Interesting. In any case, if you're ever in doubt of who's responsible, just blame it all on Elion because Elion is. Everything comes from Elion, and even that's not certain. So uh, I guess we'll, we'll get a move on with the topic. Right. right. So what I was going to say is I, I think one of the most honestly unambiguous examples of human sacrifice in the Hebrew Bible in the context of what are seen as the protagonists, so, you know, like the heroes of the Hebrew Bible, where mm -hmm. they're actually, you know, doing this. And I mean... And if it's I were condoned. Asking, what? And it's condoned. Well, I mean, see, so that's the thing. It's it's a tricky loophole. But basically, if I were to ask you, who is the most famous person in the Hebrew Bible? In the Hebrew Bible, which means the Old Testament? Yeah. Hmm. Or okay, like maybe not the most famous, but like if you were to name the top three people in the Hebrew Bible, who would it be? Not humans. Um, Jezebel? Okay, not you. I'm talking about the average evangelical. Um, Jesus? He's not in the... Well, okay, they're going to read him in, but I'm not <laughs> actually in the Hebrew Bible. Um, uh, um, Moses? Abraham? Well, mm-hmm. And maybe Jacob? Or Samuel? Or... So uh, Daniel or whatever. So, so let's just look at that. Abraham. Uh, he gets this, you know, it's a, he gets an instruction from, um, I think at this point it's being referred to as like El or El Shaddai, but basically he's instructed to take, um, let's see, I actually have this pulled up somewhere. Where is it? View tab here. Uh, Binding of Isaac. Um, so, What's interesting, so, um, and it was after, um, sometime after God put Abraham to the test, saying to him, Abraham, he answered him, here I am. Oh, Let's get Isaac ready what? for the sacrifice. But what's interesting here, and I want to point this out, if I could just show this real quick, um, if you could just mm -hmm. pop, pop it, I have it uh, sharing screen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how, how do you share the screen? Um, you just add it to the. Um, oh, oh, yeah. Oh, you can, you can do that and I can add yeah. it. Can yeah, I make it uh, bigger? Yeah, yeah. It's uh, you have to change the frame to one of the other ones. It's right below the window. It um, there's like a few different slots. Oh, I see. Okay, let's make it bigger. That's what she said. <laughs> oh, that's what that's what I not said. <laughs> okay. Is it? Uh, let me know when it's bigger. Um, it's going to be one of the ones to the right. There, yeah. yeah. It's bigger. Right. Yeah. So um, what, what's really interesting here 
is that you have um and he said take um please take or like pray take your son at yechidecha your your only or like your unique son now what's interesting is that this word yachid is very close to i mean like in pronunciation to yedid um it only has one like one difference in letter and yedud um which also shares a root with david which means beloved was actually the title that was according to the phoenician um history as preserved by eusebius it's post i mean realistically because it is a semitic root and because it has ties to this older tradition of like the son who sacrificed I, I do think that probably that was uh, older preservation, but you have this son who sacrificed by his father, who in this case is said to be Elus or El and um, slash Kronos. And he sacri uh, he offers him up as a sacrifice um, to like avenge the, like, uh, or to appease the avenging gods, or I forget exactly how it goes. But what's interesting is that here, it, um, th this word, like your favored son whom you love, that is not Yechidecha. Yechidecha means your only son and uh, your only unique solitary. Um, and so what, what I'm proposing is that in this case, it might have actually been Yechidecha instead of Yedidecha because of the um, desire to, um, to remove out this context that previously had been associated with a figure named Yedud. And so... Mm -hmm. Um, that also could be one of the reasons why, while you have like, you know, different names for different figures in the Bible, that Isaac, his name is given as like, it's an explanation, like, like it's taken from Sarah laughing, but it, it's like, in, in essence, it's, it's not to say that he couldn't have had another name and that this is just, you know, another form of that myth where rather than being sacrificed he's actually saved and rather than the one sacrificing him being l he's potentially about to be sacrificed to l so it it's like reversing the narratives but it's still preserving the context in a way that so many people today can't see it it's interesting because that also has a parallel with the christian theology as well oh definitely oh wow i didn't even see this Take your son, your favorite son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moria and offer him there as a burnt offering. So the burnt offering there definitely connects this idea of the molech offering, um, uh, where it's like a whole, holy burnt one. Um, on one of the heights I will point out to you, you also have this idea of offering it on a height, which later on, if it's not in the temple, gets seen in a pagan context. But where it gets really, really interesting is that... Um, regarding what you said with the Christian parallel. So early next morning, Abraham saddled his ass and took with him two of his servants. You also have this idea of like the servants of the God. So it's parallel there. And, and the asses. asses. No. What? And the, oh, and the asses, of course. Definitely. I. It's like it's so awesome. ingrained. I almost it's forgot true. about that. But then here, he split the wood for the burnt offering. Like here in this case, you have this idea. Well, because in either case, with the wood of the burnt offering, he's being sacrificed on the wood by nature of the wood being set on fire and consuming him. But in the case of, you know, the crucifixion, that being seen as a sacrifice, he's still, you still have this figure being killed on the wood, but by means through force and not through fire or like, um, it's, it's a continuity of human sacrifice as the basis of, you know, the human right to live. It goes through the Canaanite religion in uh, Sen Cuniaton's text where El is sacrificing his son and the Baal epic where Baal is the sacrifice. He sacrifices himself to Maut. And then through this uh, Jewish sacrifice of Abraham, of Isaac, or if you're Muslim, Ishmael. And through to the Christian where God sacrifices God L sacrifices himself to himself. <laughs> it's a, a harmonization of the Gentile and Jewish uh, human sacrifice traditions. Also, one of the great ironies is that if people understood the context of what firstborn son meant, 
they would know that it doesn't have to be Isaac or Ishmael. It could be both. He could have tried to sacrifice them both because it's not the firstborn of the father. It's the firstborn of the womb. Not mm. the womb. Yeah, they always try to erase the women from history. Yeah, it's like, don't forget that women... <laughs> I'm joking, but, you know, obviously <laughs> speculative, but, you know, within the context of this supposed narrative, don't forget that, you know, it wasn't just, the, you, you know... It wasn't just this patriarchal time where everything was according to the man. You know, women had to sacrifice their firstborn children too. Like, I mean, obviously it's not that simple. And um, like, e e the, the interesting thing is I, even um, even sources from outside of these civilizations talk about these sacrifices typically being done only in times of extreme distress. Mm -hmm. Usually in cases of war. And the other exception to that being, you know, the death of a ruler where human sacrifice would be undertaken as a way of sending servants, wives, and other possessions. Man, Naram Sin treats objects like women, man. And it's sending them to the afterlife. Which the Egyptians did, the Nubians did. It was a very common practice. Even in China and Mesoamerica, it seems to be a human staple. The Vikings sending you know, property, you know, to, to the afterlife. It, you know, it, it is interesting because that's the one thing that like, you know, most people now, I'd say as a generality, like, obviously it's not to say that everyone is, but I think most people kind of, and I don't know if I'd say recognize, but believe um, that, you know, I guess it all depends on if you believe there's an afterlife or not. But even if you do believe there's an afterlife, because most people who believe in, actually, that's, yeah, I mean, basically, no, but even with these traditions where you have this idea of an afterlife, usually you don't have this idea that anything in this world you can actually take with you. That that really has its roots more in, like, in a lot of ways, like, pre-philosophical traditions. You see mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, it's it's, it's very much like this is a tradition that many societies around the world, as a part of their philosophical development, independently came to the conclusion that you can't bring it with you. Confucius did. Uh, this is a tradition of Diogenes. It's like, uh, like they asked him, how do you want to be buried? And he said, just throw me over the wall. But what about the wild animals? Oh, just give me a stick. I'll fend off the wild dog. And it's like, but you won't be conscious. You won't be able to use the stick. It's like, that's the yeah. point, bros. Yeah, and it re reminds me of this one thing from Ecclesiastes. And uh, I wish, I wish people who were so insistent that the Bible preaches, you know, an afterlife. Well, then how come it says? I guess you could argue, you could apologeticize your way out of it. But what, how come it says that it's better to be a living dog than a dead lion? It's, you know, basically, that's like this, um, I guess that's like the life and death version of it's better to be a citizen, a poor man in Rome than a king in Gaul. Mm hmm Very much so. Also, well, I mean, they had an idea of an afterlife. And this is a question that's very ambiguous when it comes to the Canaanite religion. So the Canaanite religion kind of sometimes harmonized and absorb syncretize different religious traditions concerning the afterlife which is obviously important if you're studying the development of the abrahamic religions but the canaanite people the pagan canaanite people some of them the the majority belief seems to have been something like the mesopotamian afterlife where you go to a stinky dusty muddy afterlife where you drink muddy water and you eat dust and that's a typical canaanite afterlife but then you also have the land of freedom, which is a parallel to Egyptian huh? notions of an afterlife. Holy crap. Do you, do you know what, Simon, so, mean, there's a few words for it, but do you know what one of the words for freedom is in Hebrew? Huria? <laughs> yeah, and I think about this. What, um, it, like, for instance, there's this one song uh, that's sung during Passover. Avadi Mainu, we were slaves. Ainu, uh, wait, was an, uh, um, we were in Egypt. Avadi, hi. Wait, oh, yeah. um, 
Ata Ata Bene Hori. And now and now Bene Hori, we are Bene, the children of Horin, of freedom. We are free, like free men. Now, isn't that kind of interesting that Horin? And again, I, I if it's probably just the case that it's like it's a you know, it's an expounding upon uh Horia with the nun making it Horin. Um, and that's why it wouldn't be Horon, but I do kind of wonder whether there is a connection between this idea of Horon as, uh, be, because I have found scholarship that links Horon actually with Eshmun, and it's almost like Eshmun is the resurrected, and Horon is the, like, is Eshmun in the underworld, for lack of a better term. That but makes sense. I, well, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is also based off of a lot of syncretic thought like going back to Hellenism. So it's kind of hard to really be certain, but, um, but just this idea of like this idea of the whore. Oh, this is actually interesting because the whore is the cave. And it's almost like the cave that you escape from. You're out into the light, you know, kind of pulling on this idea of Plato's cave, almost like the cave as a type of prison. And the, the cave is also very much taken as sort of like symbolic of death, that, that death the land of the dead in Shechem Emet that, that uh, Mot dwells in and Baal has to send his messengers to is caverns. That's his, his land. That's the land of the dead. That They can actually enter and exit just the same way as in Greek mythology. Interesting. Oh, and speaking of Eshmoon and sacrifice, what part of his body did Eshmoon cut off? Do 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 Uh I'm guessing it's a part that's involved in something that rhymes with Srocrepation. Stroke Srocrepation. Snoop! Yeah, so Eshmoon underwent an emasculation which led to his death and it was a self-inflicted emasculation he had a little bit of the self snippy snip and that is a good transition i think into the topic of sacrifice and the meaning of sacrifice in the ancient world and the modern world and every other world you're oh you're you're finding something so have you ever heard the theory well so first of all before i go into that what what is Eshmoon typically depicted as holding? Snaky snakes. Okay. I, now, am I wrong? Oh wait, is this is this from you? That's a song I wrote. Yeah. Nice. So, um, if you look at the snaky snake stuff, well, first of all, clear parallels to the story of Moses. But there's also um, apparently there are some esoteric interpretations of the staff that Moses pulled out that it, in, that it in, was in this context, we call it yeah. the caduceus. That's the snaky snake staff, which I, I also like I've looked into this and apparently it isn't a Semitic etymology, but I still kind of wonder if there isn't this connection between the term caduceus and kadosh. It seems likely. And to, to, to bring in like a personal anecdote yesterday, two sneaky, sneaky snakes, a male and a female, crawled up the uh up onto my porch and well the female's pregnant now so they had some freaky snake sex on my balcony traumatizing my uh family as it were <laughs> and i was like that's a good omen but the snake why was the snake particularly demonized in abrahamic religions Because it symbolizes healing and rebirth through procreation. That's the basis of the pagan religions. And the prohibition against procreation, the hatred of procreation, the hatred of sex, the hatred of life, the worship of death, this is the, as far as I'm concerned, this is the fundamental sin at the root of the world's evils. The, the, the ideology of Shamuma, the world's first evil. I mean, I personally think that 
it would be reductive to say that it's only one way because there's multiple streams of thought within every tradition. Of course. So like you, you definitely have preservations of this idea, for instance, um, I'm trying to think, um, I mean, like for, for instance, um, and given it, you know, it obviously was, uh, you know, it would be hard to say this goes all the way back, but there are elements of like, um, and given not to say that there aren't, you know, other issues, but, uh, in terms of like religious Judaism, not, not viewing sex as something bad, but something which like, you know, should be used only for procreation. Mm -hmm. Um, but specific, like, like for instance, I actually was talking about this the other day, um, made a comment about it, but there's actually a tradition. It's an oral tradition in, um, Judaism that, um, it's, it's actually from the Garrett HaKodesh, which is, um, from what I understand, it's actually, it's a, it's a Hasidic text, but it basically talks about how, um, if a um, was it if a man quote unquote well actually no so that's not so much quote quote if a woman quote unquote emits seed first then the child will be male and if the male emits seed first then the child will be female and what that's basically saying is and again there is it's it's almost like you have this uh, what's it's polysemy like multiple narratives within the same thing so in one case you have this idea of, well if you want male children, which clearly according to cultural standards you want, then that means that you need to, you know, make your wife the priority in terms of who's getting pleasure so that you can have male children. Now, there's obviously issues saying, well, that means that if you're only thinking about yourself and you're being selfish, then you'll get female children. Well, I mean, there's implicitly some issues that arise with that, but just this idea that like pleasure is even something that is significant and like, I, I think that it, like, when I saw that, it really kind of blew my mind in terms of how different some expectations are versus reality. Again, that's not to say that, like, I don't know. I, I guess what, what, what it comes down to is um, if you're viewing something as, like, a moral necessity versus a ritual purity thing, because I don't think there's anything wrong with view, like, because also, I mean, here's the thing, like, with the idea of like Nida and, you know, people being quote unquote unclean, that's only in the context of going to the temple. Since we don't, since there's no more temple, it doesn't really have, I mean, unless you take things super seriously because you feel that it's part of, you know, bringing it back. But I, I guess like at the end of the day, there is a lot of um, nu nuance to this. But what, what I did want to bring up uh, before I got too off topic is, um, Okay, so th this is from Jewish Moroccan archive. I'm trying to look for like a more academic source, but um, I did just want to find something real quick. So um, the Pact of Isaac, the night before circumcision is commemorated as Isaac's Eve. According to Jewish mythology, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs made a powerful team that prevented armies of envious angels from snatching the souls of newborn babies since 1900 BCE or whereabouts. It was a war of light against darkness. Friends and family members played a role in this war on Isaac's Eve. On this occasion, the night before circumcision, friends gather from close and far to face the angel's threat up front. A candle is lit at the head of the infant's bed and the congregation chants psalms. When the moon reaches its peak, this assembly studies Torah, neglecting not the book of splendor, which is uh, Zohar, until dawn chases the remains of last night's darkness, appeasing the snake. Circumcision takes place at sunrise. According to Jewish mythology, the removal of the foreskin is a form of sacrifice made to appease the snake in all likelihood in ancient divinity. Glaucon wants foreskins. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think Shaul wants his foreskins, but Glaucon <laughs> wouldn't mind. Yeah. Uh, oh, God, I ruined my own joke. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, this is fat. It is important to note that Moroccan Jews distinguish between legend and reality. They are fully aware that some of the rituals practiced by their elders are vestiges of ancient rites. Ding, ding, ding. Most people do not hold the old myths as absolute truth. Some of the well-educated and well-informed Moroccan Jews suspected that circumcision might be a vestige of an ancient ritual, a time when the foreskin was a type of sacrifice to a snake that was once divine, that is, before light went over darkness that ruled over the world before the time of Abraham. Circumcision is also regarded as a means to contain untamed desire in the same way learning is intended to minimize evil. Okay. So basically what, what you have, you have a lot of phallic imagery that's associated with the serpent. Um, but beyond that, you also have, like you said, the association with uh, procreation, 
also the idea of, I mean, if you want to view, um, like if you were to view, what, what what's its face? Um, if you were to view the serpent as a euphemism for a specific body part that Eshmoon happened to cut off and then, you know, I wonder if that's the staff he was carrying around with him. <laughs> well, you know, I, it's weird because, like, I don't know why, but I went on one of those websites and I saw the process by which uh, the snake is severed. Oh, God. Why did <laughs> – oh, God. Oh. And it's not a quick and easy process by any means. I, I want to scrub my head thinking about that. But you can't. But, but like when you, you know, people don't realize this, but the, the urethra is like a tube. It looks like a straw, actually. So you have to pull it out off. Like there's a oh, staff God. sticking out that it looks like fucking plastic straw. Oh, God. Why do you know this? <laughs> I just told you. I, I just told you. I know, but I mean, that's why you know that. But why do you know that? Trust me, everything happens for a reason. It's fate. Do you know that? And, and there's a reason why the goddess of fate is a monkey with a dog's head. What? There's a reason why the goddess of fate is a monkey with a dog's head. What's this a reference to? The goddess Ashina. Oh, you're oh you're referencing um, the Talmud or, or no 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 it's uh, uh, the commentary or something on some 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 thingamajigger. Anyway, moving past that uh, pleasant uh, conversation, we are talking about sacrifice and what makes a sacrifice a sacrifice. Oh, it's because it's dear. Real quick, I did just want to share one thing that I found real quick. This is okay, from okay. the good source. All right. It was on the journey at the inn. The word Vayahi refers to Mo Moses as if to say when Moses was on the way at the inn. It is a reference to when Moses, um, you know, his son had to be circumcised like on the road because the angel was coming to kill him. The meaning of the words uh, Vayif Gashehu Adonai uh, or basically in that God met him is an angel met him. This angel is described as the holy name of God although it was one of the lower ranking angels, a category that was not in constant touch with the highest sphere in the heavens, as it had been dispatched in order to complete a specific task, task God wanted to be carried out. This is also confirmed by blah, 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 blah. Okay, here. God confronted him and wanted to kill him. The angel wanted to kill Moses, not Eliezer the baby. Even though the angel was dispatched by the attribute of mercy, he tried to kill Moses. Okay, where's the thing? Something about snake, 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 snacky snack. Sorry. Is the one where the baby gets circumcised? Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, wait, here I found it. Um, oh, wait. Uh, the meaning of the two verses is that Moses sent his wife and children ahead of him if he had been walking and they were riding on the donkey. It makes sense that they arrived at the end before he did. When the Torah wrote of the angel he wanted to kill him, the reference must be to the infant Eliezer. The angel assumed the shape of a snake devouring the upper half of the baby's body down to the area where the circumcision should have occurred. The snake then spit out the baby and started to devour him from the feet upward, stopping at the same area as previously. At that point, Sipora, realizing what the problem was, seized a sharp piece of flint and performed the act of circumcision. She had understood that the whole phenomenon was a punishment for not circumcising the infant. On the eighth day, the eighth day, Shmone, connected to Eshmoon. Holy crap, how did I not see this before? Well, I guess it wasn't faded. Um, and also, these are an animal otherwise associated oh with their long schlong. Holy crap. Have you ever, surely you've heard of the idea of the, um, and, and now you are a bridegroom of blood. Have you ever heard that? It doesn't ring a bell, but I guess we're about to find out about that. So. I swear it's penises all the way down. Or all the way up, or more like. Snakes so, all the way down, I guess. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so he, uh, so he let him alone. Okay, with his uh, twenty six is um, oh dang it. Uh, okay, this is from. Oh, I guess I could have just searched it there. Yeah. All right, bridegroom of blood. Sorry about this, but yeah, what what I'm thinking is this idea of the bridegroom of blood, 
or in essence, a bloody bridegroom. Could that be Ashmoon? Like, in in a sense? Yeah, well, it could be. It's like he is he is fleeing the goddess of love and marriage and all these institutions by snip snip. Yeah, and holy crap, this is literally so Sipor took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched his legs with it, saying, You are truly a bridegroom of blood to me. Khatan Damim, like a, a, a groom of blood, blood groom. This is, I really think there's something here, but um, definitely something to touch on another time. There's, there's definitely some thingy. <laughs> oh, actually, I was wondering if there's any uh, Hebrew meaning to Atar and Gattis, like the from the goddess, like Atar is a title of Baal. Atar Baal is mentioned in the Baal epic. And there's also the goddess Atargatis, of which the priests, or they are made into priestesses by the severance of their sneaky snakes. And they find women's clothing in the next house, and the women are obligated to give them women's clothing and jewelry so they can live there thereafter as women. So, okay, this is interesting. Ultimate sacrifice. So Atar could, in a, in, oh, shit. In, in a certain context, could mean to shut up, to close, or to bind, to bend, to curve, that which surrounds and closes. Personally, I think it's a bit of a stretch to say that would be connected to that, but... Hmm. Binding can have two contexts related to sacrifice. You bind the, the beast of sacrifice, and if you want to... I know you don't want to hear about this, but they tie it tight first before they. That's the yeah, process. That's... Yeah, that's... that's the process. I know animal husbandry. Atar gatis. So, um, so the other possible uh, route for atar would be with an ayin, which definitely connects. So atar means to pray to supplicate. Whoa, atara in Arabic is slaughter for sacrifice. So Baal is the god of sacrifice, not just because he is offered sacrifices too, but because he is the sacrifice. He dies to save humanity. Holy crap. And you know what else that there means? It what also else? means to be abundant or abundance. Mm -hmm. Wow. So abundance of Baal and the sacrifice of Baal. And then yeah, it's like... Atar could also be sup supplicant or suppliant and worshiper as well. So that, that fits with the uh, Atargatis. So um, the, I'm, I'm aware of some of the, we're aware of some of the philology of the Atar part. Is there anything to Gatu or Gadu? Oh, there's Gad, Gad means something. I don't know if the T and the D sort of connect in a sort of way. Gata, get. Gath, maybe. Hmm. What was Gath had an interesting meaning? It, it means oh, interesting. It means press. Why am I keep getting reminded of that damned website? I know you were going to say that. Oh God! Wait, oh. you've seen these videos, haven't you? No, I haven't. But I know what the internet is like. So there, the, the man was laid out flat. Yeah, I don't The thing know. was coming through just testicles. Oh, and they were squished and pressed like olives. I imagine that the juice must have come out like the oil of olives. Oh, God. I'm pretty sure that was a torture method in the ancient world. It's a big sacrifice. Let's transition to something pleasant. Human sacrifice. Right. Yeah. So, but yeah, so here you have, you have got, which means wine press. Also, because the shesh and the, um, or sorry, I mean the shin uh, and the tough are connected. Um, gashash could be connected to got. Um, and so there it could also mean to feel with a hand, feel or stroke. Or grope. But I, I think it's more likely... Honestly, I it would be interesting to look into um, the etymology of other goddess, but I'm I'm not a hundred percent sure. 
Well, let's let's talk about sacrifice. Yeah, like you say, I said sacrifice. If I wanted to sacrifice, you know, oh yeah, I'll sacrifice this ripped pair of pants. It's useless. Forget about it. Sacrifice means you give up something dear, and this plays to human psychology. It's called a credibility enhancing display. When a leader demonstrates their true faith in the subject by giving up something that's very dear to them, whether it's their life in the case of Jebus or their children or a sheep, if you're a uh, Hebrew, uh, your penis, uh, this is a credibility enhancing display. People know that you believe in it. And people have a hard time telling the difference between whether something is untrue or a lie. Because if someone, if they believe that someone believes something, they find it hard to understand that it could be wrong. <laughs> okay, I'm going to finish this, and then you can tell your freaky eureka because we're having a lot of freaky eurekas now. The the, the sacrifice uh, has been shown scientifically. That the more you have to give up in a religious community, the more devoted you would be. In studies of 19th century utopias or communal experiments, the religious ones succeeded more than the secular ones. And the more difficult the sacrifice to be in the community, the longer it would last. Now you're Eureka. All right. So... You know who probably the most maybe unheard of, but significant, um, like ritual castrato in the Hebrew Bible is ritual castrato in the Hebrew Bible. Zebulon. It's actually Nathan Melech. Now it's kind of interesting because Nathan Melech. What, what's Nathan Melech? They, they, it's saying that's his name, Nathan Melech. Which I guess in this context, they're trying to say, like, the king gave, but it just, it doesn't make sense. It's not a name that's ever really attested. Like, you could say it's a royal title, but if you're saying it's a royal title, you basically have to, like, like if it's something like, um, where Melchizedek, where, you know, Melech is in it, but usually... Like Mel Melky isn't going to be part of a proper name. It's going to be more of a title. And so the point here is, so it says in English, the translation is near the chamber of the eunuch, Nathan Melch. It's, it's talking about um, like all the things being done away with um, by the priests. So the priests of the shrine, the Tophet, which is where uh, in the Valley of Ben Hinnom. Oh, directly tying into this so that no one might consign their son or daughter to the fire of Molech. Um, and that, that, that's pretty key because, again, it's implying that's one thing here, but it's not certain. Then here you have, um, he did away with the horses that the kings of Judah had dedicated to the sun at the entrance of the house of God. Now, it's probably connected to the idea of Shamash, you know, or Shapash, either or, driving a chariot uh, or riding a chariot driven by horses um, near the chamber of the eunuch. So it's saying the chamber... Um, uh, oh, wait, here's the key thing. So it calls him a saris. So this word saris means official or eunuch, but it, it means in a, someone who's an official that is a eunuch. And mm -hmm. so um, they choose to translate this as the eunuch, Nathan Melech, rather than the saris, Natat, the saris king, Nathan. Like, it could just be saying his name is Natan and that he's the king and that he's a Saris, but because they don't want to imply that he was a king that was also a eunuch, because how can you have a eunuch that's a king? The only reason would be because he was doing it for ritual purposes, which is explicitly forbidden. Um, and I mean, like you actually have, the, I found another reference to this where they connect, um, like one of the seven Noahide laws is the for the forbidding or like for, you know, the, the forebodeness, like getting rid of, um, they're basically pro prohibition of castrating any living animal, which would also include a human, which I think has been of, abrogated in Christianity. Actually, they brought back the tradition. If they, in, in Christian religion specifically, they have verses that abrogate the prohibition against 
the severance of the snake if it prevents you from sinning. Oh, yeah, like if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off? Yes. And hand is almost always synonymous either with milit with, with like violence and force or with the violent, forceful snake. Interesting. Priapus. So let, let's no, get Priapus and Glaucon are <laughs> they're good friends. Let's say they fit each other like a glove or maybe a sock. <laughs> God. Lowy, lowy. <laughs> so, um, uh, what, 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 what else? Um, oh, yeah, going back to the sacrifice. We're, we're talking about more human sacrifice and. Yeah. Oh, I, I, you have something prepared for this? Oh, about this or it's a sacrifice, human sacrifice. Well, obviously, there's the obvious cases of human sacrifice in Tanakh. The the famous one being the story of Abraham and Isaac, but others as well. The story of Jephthah and his daughter. The story going that Jephthah promises God the first creature that greets him from his house after he defeats the Ammonites, obviously defeats the Ammonites. The first creature that greets him is his daughter. He lets his daughter lament her virginity, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, say no more, for one month, and then snip. Well, not snip, slip. They say uh, the fastest way to a woman's heart is through her stomach, but that's not true. The fastest way to a woman's heart is through her sternum, first of all. <laughs> That's how you spatchcock uh, a sack. <laughs> this is this is gonna be community violation. Okay, and then the, the other another story that's less well known is in Kings. I'm thinking it's in Second Kings, first or Second Kings, and except like as a complete aside from the story of Ahab and Jezebel, which is contemporary with this, there is an Israelite who it has to consecrate the city of Jericho to resettle it by sacrificing his firstborn son to Yahweh in it. That's another example of human sacrifice, a less ambiguous example of human sacrifice in Tanakh. You also have the tradition of the Kings of Israel who sacrificed their children to foreign gods. Yes, this is, this is part of the ideology that's later developed, the propagandistic ideology where they are associating any foreign culture. This 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 comes out of the Deuteromistic area, era where foreign gods, foreign religions are associated with human sacrifice as opposed to Yahweh, which is which is framed as being virtuous and against human sacrifice rather hypocritically. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting because when you have these commands to like, and given, they probably, like, realistically, they never happen. But again, that doesn't mean that they aren't used to inspire modern day horrors. Um, but what I would say is that I think there's, um, wait, shoot, what was I saying? Sorry. Um, uh, sorry, I'm uh, just, okay, right. So with um, the whole narrative of, um, oh yeah, like, you know, destroy entire cities, wipe out everyone except for, you know, like the children, like th those narratives, I mean, it's, that, that's being, that, that's not just war that's being waged for the sake of warfare. It's being done within this, um, like, geopol or within this, um, like, um, you know, within a religious context. And even though it didn't happen, it still sticks in people's minds as if it did. And with that, you, you basically have this idea of sanctified or justifi justified or sanctified uh, warfare, which in essence isn't that different from sacrifice. And, except and genocide, people. of course. Where, I mean, where, the, yeah. oh, what, what, what I was going to say, though, is in the case of, um, like, whereas with a sacrifice of an animal, people get you know, the meat or the skin or whatever, or the, you know, ivory or the, you know, bones, 
with um when, when it comes to you know peoples you're dealing with looting of people's possessions of their livelihoods the um in the I mean, it's really, really dark stuff. And I think that ultimately, you know, it is problematic if you do compare it to, you know, the slaughter of animals. But at the same time, I think that it's about contextualizing it. Whereas like, I don't know. I, I mean, I, that's one of those things that I think that at the end of the day, even though I have issues with idea of animal sacrifice, I mean, as well as human sacrifice, I do think that it still is more moral than the system that we live under where it's just normal to just, you know, buy meat in a supermarket and like there was no care taken to the animal. It's just literally about profit motive. Yes, actually quite, quite so. Like there is a degree of sacrifice, moral sacrifice that we are perfectly willing to put up with for the perpetuation of capitalist society. The suffering of animals being a large one. Obviously, food stock animals like cows and pigs and chickens are treated in the most inhumane conditions imaginable. Like, imagine chicken run but Schindler's List instead of The Great Escape. I wish we could have done more. And then yeah, they should do a chick chicken version of Schindler's List someday. I have a feeling that would quickly get shut down. Yeah, cancel Colette's hashtag cancel Colette's. Yeah, you just you'd have to do it independently, but I still I don't know. That'd be okay. Well, and the, on top of that, more charismatic animals are also sacrificed to the global machine. There are puppy farms where more charismatic animals like dogs and cats are subject to the same inhumane conditions of breeding and torture that food stock animals are, and then sold to unwitting people who don't aren't aware they're participating in this brutal trade. And they don't want to know. You don't want to know how the sausage gets made. Yeah, the butcher's share. Yeah. And um, on talking about that's animal sacrifice, talking about human sacrifice, we are willing to sacrifice nearly an unlimited number of people in our imperialist ambitions as collateral damage. And this is not something even unique to liberal countries. Socialist countries did that. Obviously, fascist countries were perfectly willing to let an unlimited number of their citizens die for the achievement of their war aims. There is going to be human sacrifice irrespective of what ideology is practiced. What was unique and shocking about what seems to have been practiced in the ancient Near East of infant sacrifice is that it was the children of the elites given up. In war, children are very frequently slaughtered or effectively slaughtered by the destruction of their caregivers. The casualties in war are not simply limited to violent slaughter with the sword, starvation, disease, depredation of all kinds comes as a companion to war, as the four horsemen, of course. So with any war, children are dying even if you're not targeting them. <laughs> what, what makes it unique and reprehensible to our ancient authors was not that children are dying. They're perfectly comfortable with letting children die. They were exposing ugly children, you know? It's who they were dying to. It was who, it was that they were, it was not, not even who they were dying. It was more about that it was the children of the elite, healthy children of the elite who were being offered up. That didn't sit right with them. Like the sons of kings, the sons of aristocrats, the Carthaginian nobles who loved their babies would be sacrificing them according to the Roman sources. And this is what appalled the Romans. Not that the death of children was occurring at all, but which children and in which way. Obviously, the Romans had their own bloody spectator sports where people were essentially sacrificed in a festive and almost religious atmosphere 
Oh, you could go even further. Just look at the triumphs. They literally, yeah, the triumphs. yeah literally they, they would sacrifice um, like, you know, ceremonial victims, usually like leaders or priests of, um, of conquered peoples in front of, you know, all of Rome. I mean, yeah, and in front of the temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, these fucking Romans, they Autobot. can go suck my dick. Autobots roll out. Hey, Romans, come mess up someone your own size. The funny thing is everybody's the, the same size at some point in history, just never the same. I will say that having seen Romans, they're not as big as us Carthaginians in the size of their Glaucon. And certainly not Thracians. Woo-wee, their Glaucon is pre in in, in uh, dimension. You know that's 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 what uh, uh what was her name? God, it only works if you can do it fluently. What was Alexander Olympias was on about or in about and around and all yeah, over out. with Zeus Zeus Splooge. Okay, enough with the Zeus Splooge. Um when we're talking about human sacrifice, we are giving up children every day to human sacrifice. If we are concerned with human sacrifice, it's not to justify war. We should be arguing from the perspective of putting an end to war. Because every war is a death sentence for thousands of children. Okay, this feels like a super inappropriate time to to to, to say this, but I have to be right back. Uh, priests, uh, priests of Paul pulling up. I'll be right back. I guess he has to check on the baby back ribs in the oven. Uh no, I I, I don't eat pork. I know. Oh maybe, no, the... maybe the long pork. Oh God, no, that, that's not funny. That's not. <laughs> While you're gone, I'm going to plug my book if I can find it. I wrote a book called Seven Times and Seven Times I Bow, which is available on Amazon. It's available on Amazon. You can buy it. Just Google Kohan Colette's Amazon. You'll find my Amazon page, and you can give me money through it. Mainly, you'll give money to Amazon, or you can DM me on Instagram, Colette Siegel. And I can send you a PDF of both or either of my books for an optional donation and a review on the Amazon website or Goodreads, as you prefer, talking about the books. These books cover the history of the Amarna period, a transformative era in the history and religion of the land of Canaan. That led to the development of the Abrahamic religions, don't you know, somehow. And it puts you in the world of ancient Canaan in a way that few books really can. Other books might be too academic. Looking at pot shirts, how boring. My book is exciting, but it's authentic. It's authentic to the history of the time. You feel like you're walking on those Canaanite roads in the city of, Ke of Gezer, Shechem, Hazor, and Megiddo. You feel like you're actually there. Man, it's like, it's, it's like a whole vibe, man. The second book, Hail Like the Sun. Hail Like the Sun. It's talking about the Hittites and the Akhenaten's uh, reforms, the reforms, the worship of the sun god, Aten, oh, it's just, it's just, it's just the trip. It's just the, you know, and it's an interesting book, interesting ending, lots and lots of great stuff. Feels like you're actually there. Subversions and, but it's realistic and man, it's, it's a good time. You got to read these books. They're very historically authentic. I put all my research into them. I, I know everything, man. I will get my brain. Oh, yeah, it's just, it's just spilling out of the page. It's filled with nuggets, juicy, sexy nuggets of knowledge, man. Get this knowledge, esoteric. And rather than telling you, rather than telling you how good it is, 
I mean, like telling you about how the history was. I show you the history. It's like a movie, man. It's like Game of Thrones in book form. If Game of Thrones was a book, can you imagine Game of Thrones as a book? Forget that last example. Read the book. Read the book. Okay. Well, I can put the link up on screen. What oh. did I come back to? You you came out to my uh, author shilling. Actually, speaking of which, people assume, uh, interestingly enough, that whenever you have a, a sacrifice, that, that's going to inc include like a barbecue. And of course, in in the ancient Near East and in ancient Greece, sacrifices were often greeted with a barbecue. It was a community building event. And I think people also assume that when you had this hypothetical human sacrifice that involved cannibalism. So in, there's a scene in my book in the end where they're practicing the ritual evolving like the feast of the gracious gods. You're muted. Are you okay? Yeah, sorry. Um, sorry, keep, keep going. So the, the Feast of the Gracious Gods where they are searing a kid, a baby goat in his mother's milk, and some of the readers are like, this is cannibalism, like, because they don't realize that kid uh, means a baby goat, not a baby, you know, homo sapiens. <laughs> and like, it, it's interesting. I guess they assume the worst when it comes to the Canaanites because the all they're given is the worst. Yeah, like for instance, my offering for the temp my, my, my offering for the temple was just some hash in exchange for some kikayon. I'll let you guys figure that one out. Some hash. So you so you so you got some corned beef? Huh? Corned beef, corned beef hash. No, 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 no. The good hash. Ashisha. Ah, so it's it's uh it's corned beef that you smoke in a pipe. I feel like that's how you get lung issues. Well, I guess that's why Irish are, people are always smokers. You, you know, technically, I guess you could say that's what God does because you're smoking the meat so that he can breathe it in. Yeah. He's, why do the gods always want sacrifice? That's what I always get when like, I show sacrifices in my movies. They always kill the animal, burn it. What do the gods get out of it besides the smell and the savory scent of the, the smoke? And I'm thinking, really, it isn't so much for the gods. It's for the people. The sacrifice is for the people. It's the one public display of the temple, actually. It's, it's the temple's reinforcement of shared community, shared values. That's, that's what sacrifice is as well, apart from giving something up. It's also sharing something out in the ancient world especially ancient greece and rome one of the few times poor citizens poor people would get to eat meat is when they're killing an animal for the gods and also probably desensitize people to violence so they can go you know raid their neighbors raid some sabines you know what i mean wink wink nudge nudge say no more You know what? Uh, I think those red state senators ought to delete their search history. Wait, why? What do you think they're looking up? Especially the women. Oh, you know, just Roman history. Nothing, nothing uh, saucy. Just Roman history. Particularly Roman kingdom, you know, with Romulus. Just, just, just some of the stuff the boys were getting up to with the Sabine women. Ugh. Ugh. Okay. Um, now just imagine Porky Pig with Elmer Fudd. Let's clean our heads. Wait, what? Just, just imagine Porky Pig and Elmer Fudd just having a perfectly consensual... Never mind. I'm pretty sure that in Bible times, and again, that itself is kind of a misnomer, but um, according to the Bible, you do that... Well, I mean, honestly, in that case, I mean, I I definitely have less issue um, with someone being killed for for that than like uh, you know obviously there's issues killing people for you know 
Also, wait, I guess the, the point, you know, I'm, I'm just going to leave this analogy alone. I'm just leaving it alone. You know, they would usually kill the animals uh, when this was involved as well. This happened in early America a surprising amount of times. What do you mean? Bestiality. Oh, God. They would hang the sow also. What? Oh. Oh, I, I thought you were saying they, they would... Yeah, uh, wait, like, they, 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 would ha they would hang the animal as, like, a punishment for the animal or something? Yeah, because the punishment for the animal, because the animal tempted the man to sin with it. How dumb are people? Well, Einstein had a quote. He said, there are only two things that are infinite. The universe. And stupidity. And Glaucon. Glauc no, and man stupidity. And Priapus's long Glaucus. Long, long schlong. Long plomb. He, he, he comes with a plomb. Um, a plomb. <laughs> but we talked about a lot of different things related to sacrifice. I was wondering if you had anything else. Um, I'm trying to think. There's definitely... Actually, there is an interesting reference. So um, have you ever heard that it's a tradition about... What was it? Um, ah, dang it. Here, I'm going to have to look this up on Google. But because I don't remember exactly what it would have been. Um, but there's a tradition about the Egyptians um, bricking Israelite babies into buildings. That sounds a lot like um, the two things to me that reminds me of obviously the famous story about workers going into the walls of the great wall of China. And the other one, I remember that in the city of Gezer under the pillars, they found a lot of interred infants. Uh. Some of which were killed with violence. One of them was sawed in half. Uh. Um, and I'm wondering if that was sort of a, a symbolic punishment by the Egyptians. A lot of people assumed but that particular site was an example of Canaanite human sacrifice, but it could just as well have been a symbolic form of Egyptian cruelty against Canaanites, which they were known uh, to commit. Also, the Canaanites, they had their own ways of, you know, natural burials of infants to sort of go against the notion that these tofets were examples of human sacrifice. Children, like infants, had a different standard of burial than adults. Adults were able to develop more personality and therefore would have more grave goods to be buried with. But the standard burial for an infant in the ancient Levant was to be interred in a ceramic storage vessel. This was the standard. And it's not hard to imagine that these Tophet burials in Motia, these Phoenician burials that are associated with human sacrifice were just perfectly standard infant burial practices of the time. And it's also not surprising that, that perhaps uh, a form of cremation or even offering the already dead children to the gods may have taken place as a form of like, to, from dust they have come, if to dust they shall return. And almost kind of like uh, like here, like protect them in the afterlife. Uh -huh. And also in Mocha, a lot of the dead in these tophets were actually miscarried uh, fetuses or, or embryos rather than fully born children. The second thing that also casts aspersions of on the human sacrifice at Mocha is that there is actually no other sacrifice. There are no infant burials in their other burial sites. This is their only infant site for, for burials. And the mortality rate in the ancient world for children was extremely high from natural causes. So it's completely unsurprising that this may just have been the way that they dealt with the emotionally trying but not completely economically devastating loss of a child. Interesting. So it's almost like recontextualizing it as to deal with the trauma. Yeah, I was like, you you sort of see it as like, oh, well, the gods took them back. They were so good that the gods wanted them back, I guess. Oh, okay. That's actually 
perfect. Very Christian rationalization, if you ask me. That's what Christians always say when they have something like that. So this actually reminds me of the because there is a tradition that, um, like you know, the whole story of Nadav and Avihu. Actually, I've, ne I've never heard the story of Nadav and Avihu. So let's see if I can find it. Um, when even I haven't heard of it, that's some good shit. All right, so um, it's in Exodus, but why is it not? Okay, it's here. Oh wait, sheets maybe. All right. Um, why did Nadav and Avihu die here? Leviticus. Oh, it is Leviticus. I feel stupid. Okay, so <laughs> uh, going back there. Uh, okay, so it's Leviticus here. So now Nadav, now Aaron's sons Nadav and Avihu each took his fire pan, put fire in it, and laid incense on it, and they offered before Yahweh alien fire. Uh, was this um Eshzara. Um, like strange fire or alien fire, uh, foreign fire, which had not been enjoined upon them. And fire came forth from Yahweh and consumed them. Thus they died at the instance of Yahweh. But so what's interesting is um, here it says, then Moses said to Aaron, this is what Yahweh said by saying, though those near to me, uh, through those near to me, I show myself holy and gain <coughs> glory before all the people. And Aaron was silent. So he Maybe. sacrificed his nephews to, to Yahweh. I mean, I don't know if that's implicit uh, or explicit, but I mean, it's definitely a way you could read it. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more, I mean, it's definitely a way you could read it. I'm, I'm just more so pointing out that Moses is saying to Aaron that those near to me, I show myself holy and gain, like b basically saying that like they're, they're close those near to me through those near to me i show myself holy so he's saying that they were near to him and that's why they were taken up in essence that it could be that but yeah actually i can see that as well it's interesting that in this context you know that they were they were claimed by flame but they also say that um it was God, what was it? Uh, forget about it. I, I'm, I'm feeling the heat right now. I forgot what I was gonna say. I spatchcocked uh, my uh, Isaac as well. <laughs> Unfortunately, they don't have internal organs. Wait, what don't? My clay dolls. Oh, they're just clay all the way in. I mean, I, is that actually something you would do that you would actually m make realistic internal organs? You know, when I was younger, I was interested in learning anatomy as many uh, aspirant artists would be. So I tried to use hardening clay to construct bones according to the model of the skeleton and create internal organs, you know, the lungs, the heart, the liver, the stomach the intestines. And I have to say it's, it's quite a challenge to create all those things and have it not come out like a pudgy mess. It's yeah, it's definitely something evolution, man. That's a fine honed machine until you have appendicitis and you die for no reason. Oof. I had appendicitis. Thank God for modern medicine. Well, like, imagine you had appendicitis and you didn't have the money to go to a doctor to treat it. Oof. There was a friend of mine in Morocco who had this particular situation. I don't know if she passed away or not, actually. Wow. Another form of human sacrifice, maybe. Like, talking about, like, health care. American health care system is pretty bad and really expensive. It is cheaper in, you know, third world countries like Morocco and the Philippines, but they also make a lot less. So there's these weird customs in the Philippines specifically that if your loved one comes to the doctor and cannot pay, they will hold that person for ransom as like as a prisoner in the hospital wow. until their relatives cough up the money and the debt gets added to for each day. Oh my God. 
technically illegal, but obviously not. And it's, nothing is really done about it because it's the Philippines. It's like America's little brother. So, okay. I, f- I actually found something that ties back to what you were saying at the very beginning. As the king of Moab saw that the battle was too strong for him, so he took with him, um, uh, or to him, uh, 700 men drawing the sword to break through to the king of Edom, but they could not prevail. So he took his firstborn son. So this word that's used, beno bechor, habechor, so the bechor, that's not used to describe Isaac, which the fact that they used yechid, is indicative of it probably having a connection to Yadid. But um, so he took his firstborn son who is to become king in his place and offered him up as an offering up on the wall. Wait, what the, what's it mean on the wall? Like he hung him? Maybe he just, you know. Crucified him? Just maybe bashed him in on like one of those uh, cute little crenellations they have. Crenellations vocabulary word today you know those things on top of the castle that makes it look castle yeah. those are crenellations and you can have ones that are just simple like that just like square but you can also have doop 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 and it looks so much more exotic and very convenient for bashing babies heads against oh. blessed is he who dashes the baby's heads against the rocks by the rivers of Babylon <laughs> Okay, but, but but yeah. So here I wanted to point out it's it's strange. It says, and he offered him as an offering up on the wall. This is the Moabite, and a great wrath. And is this word that's used? Uh, Ketsev, um, which I don't know. I personally think it could be connected to Keteb, because the tsa to the ta, and then the fa to the ba. I don't know. It's a stretch, but. A great, a great um, wrath. Um, the situation is unclear since the text seems to slip into a Moabite perspective, namely that human sacrifice works and that the Moabite God triumphs. The effects of the passage is to deny the Israelites a complete victory under an Omrah king. Kogan uh, Tadmor quoting Dean Friedman was upon Israel so that they had to march away from him and return to the land. So this like, an, yeah, this is an explicit example of the Bible, not just confirming that other gods exist in its worldview, but that there are others that are stronger and can overpower God if they can go, you know, super Saiyan with a little bit of uh, baby bites. It's like Popeye spinach, but on a metal album cover. Huh? I'm, I'm lost. Oh, we are both lost, but we need, we will find our way in Christ. Uh. Christ, you know, he, he got nailed up. He got nails nailed with like some nails in his hands in the wood. Oh, this is interesting what you were just talking about, about like the cre- the credit s- slaves or whoever. Um, now a woman from the s- wives of the sons of the prophets cried out to Elisha saying, your servant, my husband is dead. You yourself know that your servant held Yahweh and all, but a creditor has come to take away my two children as slaves. Uh, the practice of indentured servitude was widespread in the ancient Near East. And it is this rather than child slavery, such as later existed in America and elsewhere, this is a more common form of the Bible for himself. Again, it doesn't mean that's moral, but... Um, what I think is interesting, though, is you have Elisha, and then Elisha actually has an ancient, um, an ancient Canaanite context of being a moon god. Also, very similar to the name Elisha, or Elishat, uh, the, the original Canaanite name of Dido, the Carthaginian uh, founder. Interesting. Uh, Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm also wondering if there's more phallic symbolism. The go up baldy, go up baldy. I'm, I mean, like, so, I mean, like, if you have a circumcised willy, it might look like a bald man's head. 
Ah. Uh, Waldy, go up. Wild. Why do we keep talking about penises so much? Am I secretly gay? I don't think that's the... I mean, I mean, maybe, but I don't think that's the natural conclusion. I think it just means that you're thinking with your head. Yeah, or maybe thinking with my hand. <laughs> you know, go up, Baldy, go up, Baldy. Roasting birds, blah, blah, blah. So, though, actually, now that you mention it, though, that story of, um, of Alicia and, and the bear, I mean, like, is... I mean, you, you, it's a kind of sacrifice. I mean, they're being killed. And they're being killed for taunting a bald guy. Yeah. By a bear. Is it a, I think it was like she bears. They're actually feminine bears, right? Yeah. It's, it makes a point of designating the bears as female. I'm wondering how much of this is sexual. What do you mean? Go up Baldy. Go up Baldy. The circumcised Willie. And she bears. And the children get killed by the she bears. Which is a reversal because bears are known for being very good mothers. I'm wondering what the symbolism is of that. Interesting. And also the, the use of two of them kind of echoes this idea of surrounding the god or the goddess. Maybe it's a mockery of the Canaanite feast of the gracious gods where the two goddesses service uh, uh, God when they're supposed to be killing him. So maybe they are fixing the wrong that they're doing by they're killing instead of fucking. Interesting. All right. And saw them. He saw that neither in them he saw that neither in them nor in their descendants would there be any sap of good deed. What the heck? Sap of good deed. Some yeah. say some say that Alicia saw that their hair was cut in the style of the heathens. He believed that they were degenerate and depraved and foresaw that they would never return to the ways of Torah. <laughs> the the lads pursued Alicia, continuing to mock him. He turned behind him and saw them. The prophet understood their true nature, and he, Alicia, cursed them in the name of the Lord, stating that calamity should befall them. Two, uh, two bears emerged from the forest who had perhaps lost their cubs, and they mauled 42 children from them. Slay queen. <laughs> no, no, queen. <laughs> bears, twinks. Man, they, they should make, you know... You know, gay porno of this, man. X-rated gay Bible stories. Oh, uh, okay. This is interesting. So, Alicia is... Um, um, Alicia is called the son of Shafat. Now, you know what Shafat means? Shafat means... Uh, if I'm not mistaken, judge. Yes. Now, who's called, wh whose title is Shafat? Well, in the Canaanite uh, custom, Yom, Yom, the god of the sea, is called Shafat. And yeah. the mountain he's going up, if I'm not mistaken, is the Mount of Acker. <gasps> if I'm not mistaken, which was said to be a hideout for brigands and thieves and pirates. Interesting because. If you go up just further, it says he went on from there to Mount Carmel, and from there he returned to Samaria. Where was he in Carmel? Like that that's very close to Akal. Yeah, pretty much just right there. And then right by the sea. Wow. Wait. Down by the sea. Is it down by the bay? Bears rip their flesh. The children get gobbled up mm. by she bears. Baldy gets free. So Down by the sea of the Galilee and the Dead Sea. 
and the Sea of Can well, Kinneret is just another word for Galilee. Um, sea of yeah, whatever. Yeah, okay, this is really interesting. So you have wait. So Elisha answered, Were it not that I respect King Yehoshaphat of Judah, and then his father's name is Shaphat, I can't help but feel like they're like some of the I don't know, it's like well, the title of the Israelite rulers before the kings was judge. But they would have judges who were sort of like tribal rulers. And this seems to have been a custom of many Semitic peoples where like their version of a sheikh was a judge. It's like Judge Dredd, I am the law. The law. And the, the lawgiver, this was an Amorite custom, actually. The person who enforced the law was the, the leader of the tribe, and they were called judges, or shofet, or shopet, or shiptu. So it could be grammatically female. You also see judges in the Bible. I think Deborah is an example of that, who were female judges. Oh, wow. So, and, and here you also have a reference to Elisha as an Isha Elohim. What do, like it wants it to understood be understood as a holy agent of God, but come on, it means a godly man, or not even godly man, a, a god man or a man god. Mm -hmm. Just as Elishat means a a um, a woman of God. Wait, no, no, no. I'm saying uh, mm -hmm. Ish Elohim. Mm -hmm. Wait, El Ish Elohim El Isha. I mean, it's with a wait. Where, where is it? Alicia is spelled with it. Whoa, that's actually really close. It's not you're you're missing an ayin because um there there needs to be an ayin in Yasha, but other than the ayin, Ish Elohim and Elisha have the same letters. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, it's probably just it was weird, you know, having a snake come, two snakes come up and just have sex on our balcony. It freaked out, you know, the whole family. It's like, why are people so freaked out by snakes? They're cuties, they're little cuddly, just going together. I wish, I wish, I wish I was being cuddled like a snake on a snake, twisted around with, and a rat for dinner. <laughs> So also here you have the reference to Nehushtan tying back to what we're talking about with the serpent. Mostly. Oh, yeah, the Nehushtan. Like that, 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 that's a case where the serpent isn't demonized. I really think that the demonization of the serpent that you see, you know, suppose like you don't actually have it explicit. I mean, you have it um, put into parts of it, but I really think the serpent narrative in terms of um, Genesis being seen as negative has to do with a later editing or rewriting of the mm -hmm. narrative um, by a um, by a Deuteronomic um, author. Well, the, the serpent seems very clearly associated with the wisdom in in Genesis. Oh, oh yeah, because the, because the so it also um, yeah um, because you also have this tradition of. Um, what is it um, of the, so the serpent is the guardian of the tree and then you have the tree, which is, uh, so it's the tree. Of, oh, I know this way is. So the tree of life, you have it's Chaim, mm -hmm. and then you have the serpent, which in Aramaic is Chaiwa. And then you have Eve, which is Chawa. So Chawa, Chawa, uh, Chawa, and Chai. And so the, the, there were traditions that link these all together, um, which I don't know. I, I think it's cool, like the especially the like the motif of the the lady in the tree. Um, yeah, I think it's interesting that um, where I, my my unique take on the Garden of Eden story is maybe this is a test to see if human beings have their own free will, if they can directly disobey God, if they're capable of disobeying God therefore making them equal to God in a certain sense because they can disobey him. All the other animals have to obey God. They have to do his will. 
only man and woman, humans, can exercise free will. And they showed that by, you know, disobeying God, which allowed them to ascend to the next level of existence, which is normal life. Ah, uh, normal life. How normal. Well, I guess, you know, the, the, the fucked up biblical version where you live to 900. It's not that fucked up. Uh, you know, imagine I'm like, with how bad my back is at 28. Imagine me at 900. Ugh, Ugh I can relate to that. Uh, back in my day, tablets were written on clay. You're not that old. Back, back in my day, we had lead tablets. If we wanted to send curses, we couldn't just send a mean text on our iPhone. We had to poke out a message to dismal gods on lead tablets. Just make sure to lick the letter before you send it. That's how you get the good, uh, the good particles, right? That it's uh, it makes you smarter, right? Mm -hmm. You know we're gonna try this all natural, natural sweetener, artificial sweetener made from healthy, all natural lead uh, sulfate, M made from all natural minerals. Yeah, all natural vitamins and minerals, lead sulfate. Oh, Sweeten your wine and lose weight. Oh, the sad thing is, you know, that if there weren't the regulations that there are people, there would be someone trying to sell lead as a sweetener. I wouldn't be particularly surprised if with the regulations there are, there is lead in our sweeteners. Well, yeah, but the question is, is it being added for flavor? You know, you never know because you have to kind of like take their word for it. If you're looking at the Splenda package... You you don't have like an electron microscope and a little calorie oven to start picking apart all the different chemicals in it. You just kind of have to take it on faith that the Splenda company has your best interests at heart, or just don't have Splenda. Well, it's the same thing with all sorts of commodities. Yeah, that it's honestly kind of disturbing. No one can be well informed enough that the free market could regulate themselves. That's an absolute pipe dream. Soon sure. you'll start getting ethically sourced child sex slaves if you had the absolute free market. Although a lot of libertarians would be very happy with that particular. Yeah, Ted Nugent, Ted Nugent at the top of the list. Mm -hmm. Or wait, is that who I'm thinking of? Uh... I don't know. All, all, all those libertarian rock stars kind of just blend together to me. That's what you do when you want to have a personality, but you don't. You want to look smart, but you don't have brain in head. Libertarian. Boy, you, oh, I thought you were going to say you lick lead. Yeah, lick the lead. lead the white lead paint is very oh. sweet. Don't trust the government that tells you it's bad for you. I live every day. Marty, you, you have to clarify you're joking, otherwise someone could actually try to. <laughs> I'm joking. Don't lick lead paint. Don't drink Clorox. Um, don't eat Tide Pods. Um, don't eat anything that's American, like processed food. You might as well be eating lead paint if you're eating American processed food and just rolling the dice with that. Cook oh. everything from scratch, fresh fruits and vegetables. Uh, just just eat healthy, guys. Stay fit. Go outside. Go to, go to the park. Walk okay. around in some green spaces. Have sex. It doesn't matter if a man or a woman or an intersex creature. Just... Stick your penis or vagina in something and have a good time. You know, it's, you're all consenting. What? To clarify, consenting. Yes, consent. Yeah. I think that goes without saying. Well, unfortunately, in our society, it doesn't.
Yeah. Well, we're not soldiers here. We we, we, we ask for consent. <laughs> I can imagine like the soldiers. Imagine the the soldier like who who goes up to the fifteen year old girl in Okinawa and says, "Hey, do you mind if I have sex with you?" I'll take no answer for a yes. And and she's like, "What about what's the brother yo?" And that's how you got a bunch of baby skeletons in Okinawa. Wait, why? Or two. What do you mean? Because of all the rape that the American soldiers were doing and still do in Okinawa. Oh, God. Yeah, America, world's first global empire. Alexander the Great can weep. We conquered the world. We didn't even need any phalanxes. We didn't even need any hammer and anvil. We just took over the world. Just kind of no one was, you know, we just you know, saw it lying around, took over. Yeah. Greatest empire the world's ever seen. And we're the only empire that's offended if you call us an empire. That's actually true. Imagine if Alexander the Great got pissed at you for saying he's he was building an empire. He's like, no, this is an empire. The empire is, you know, the consent of the governed, man. The taxation without representation, man. I think we're talking about off-subject things, so it's probably soon time to end the video unless you have a closing statement about the subject of the video, which is sacrifice. Um, uh, Stingray piercings? What? Stingray piercings in the Mayan religion. If you're a man, it goes through, you know, or if you're a woman, yeah, like that. Bleed for the gods, you know, the gods need blood. Wait, what? Sorry, one more time. Oh, we're just talking about Mayan blood sacrifices here. Ah. Uh, oh, actually, that's a that's an interesting. Uh, uh, like segue. Um, how? I mean, basically, you have these traditions in every culture. Yeah, the sacrifice is pretty much universal. At least in agricultural societies. Oh. Can oh, so actually. That that goes to so um, one interpretation that me and um, one of my friends Graham have kind of come up with in ter regarding Cain and Abel is that Cain killing Abel was actually the first human sacrifice. That's an interesting perspective. My perspective on Cain and Abel was that Cain, Cain killing Abel because like Cain is the agriculturalist; he's the sedentary Canaanite, and Abel is the migratory uh habiru and they wanted to create an grievance in the in the past that would justify their consistent war against people living back there in an old gezer raiding and pillaging raiding and raping raping and raiding you know you're gonna get demonetized to be honest i've never monetized my channel i don't intend to Ads suck. Sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. <laughs> you ever had an enema out your mouth? Try Raid Shadow Legends. But um, but, but yeah, about the whole idea of cannibals. So you have the agriculturalist, which you were talking about in most agricultural societies. So you have the agriculturist killing the pastoralist. But on top of that, you actually have this idea that um. So is it that? Oh wait, why? Why did Cain kill Abel? So why? If you, did yeah, he need a reason? Okay, when I'm okay. given a choice between a lesser and a greater evil, I like to try the one I haven't done before. I don't see you. You're not there. <laughs> it's just <laughs> me, Mae West. <laughs> I, wait, what's that a reference to? It's a reference to Mae West, our famous line. Hey, yeah. Oh. I'm old. I'm old. I'm old. I'm so old. Oh, I'm like grandpa over here. My grandpa pajamas. So what? So what I was referencing though is, um, there is this idea that well, Cain killed Abel because he was jealous that God liked to sacrifice more than Cain's. Mm -hmm. But 
is it actually that Cain brings, you know, like vegetative offerings, God rejects it, God accepts the meat. And so, well, Cain, he doesn't raise any animals, but you know what he does have? He has some meat that happens to be alive on the bones of his brother. Very what, savory meats that. <laughs> and then. A lot of pork. Again, like, I've heard it in reference, but I don't know enough about it to, to remember what it's called if someone doesn't reference it. So, <laughs> hey. It's, it's not cannibalism if God is eating it. I mean, it's not cannibalism if we eat ants. We eat ants all the time. We think nothing of eating ants. So how is it bad for God to eat people? If God wants to eat people, let him. Let him just take a bowl of people of all colors, like a bowl of Fruit Loops with a bunch of milk, and just well, eat it up. But, if, but, but according to Christianity, God is also a man, so then it is cannibalism. According to well, that. it's actually interesting, like about the misinterpretation of religion by the the Greco-Roman cultures, is they actually assumed that the Christians were cannibals because they would kill their god and eat him at their ceremonies. Mm. They take this this blood. It is my wine. I take this 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 bread. This is my this is my corns. <laughs> um. <laughs> But, but yeah, so with, with that idea of, um, you know, Abel being a sacrifice, it, it could have just been that Cain was trying to one-up his brother, not, by, um, not, not out of jealousy killing him, but one-upping him by offering a, a far superior sacrifice than just an animal. That's what I was thinking, you know, and that, that's a mind-blowing idea. <coughs> just on an unrelated note, a good name for a witch's cooking channel would be bunions and onions what bunions and onions would be a good name for a, a cooking channel for witches i can see that yeah at first i thought you said bundies and onions we're trying to keep ourselves child friendly here this is a this is a family channel can't be talking about bundies Somehow I doubt that. <laughs> Any, anything else you want to say before I suddenly end the stream in the middle of a sentence that I'm continuing to say, which <coughs> I'm not ending the stream. We're just going right. to keep talking forever. Well, one thing that would be interesting to just kind of maybe leave for another time is did Moloch or Moloch even exist? Oh, well, Moloch. It seems to be a, a gloss of the word melek, which means king. And it's, it would be a title of so many different deities. But a king in the ancient world, or a malek, is not necessarily a king in the same with the same level of the same sort of political connotations as it means today. Uh, that, that We kept adding and adding. The malek is akin to the Akkadian Sharu and the Sumerian Lugal. And these people are, are actually the second type of ruler in Sumeria. The first type is the N or NC, the high priest as ruler, the priest king. And then they kind of realize, you know what? We don't really like ruling so much. We kind of just like eating the sacrifices that people bring. Let's just give all the boring jobs of governing a country and military campaigns to these generals called Lugals, or if you're Sumerians, Sharu, or Canaanite Medic. And this is how the, the kingship got started as a military position. From the, from the gods, from religion, to the military. Interesting. So that might actually end up playing some role in the dual lineage motif that Christianity applies to Jesus with this idea of the priest king that one of his lines is from the priesthood and one of his lines is from the kingship and that parallels with this idea of the conquering messiah and the like the redeeming messiah mm -hmm. another of the themes in Mesopotamian religion is that the gods seem really really lazy and really easily annoyed like wealthy people do in all cases 
keep her down or oh i can't be bothered to lift a finger on my estate i'm just gonna hang out in my bed all day and draw pictures of cats and say that i'm taking more risk than you do but yeah, that's the theme in Mesopotamian religion is the gods are powerful, but they're lazy. So they pass on the responsibility to the next generation of gods who supplant them. And this is the political history of, of humankind as well. Because it wasn't usually a revolution. The revolution is the symbolic transfer of power, but the transfer of power had already occurred in every case where there's a transfer of kingship. Because it's the delegation of the labor of ruling from the previous ruling class to an intermediate class. That's the transition of power. Politically in the history of mankind is laziness. Interesting. And I, I think that on some level you can correlate that laziness to this idea of human sacrifice because at the end of the day, why do people, you know, why send people to war? It's because it's easier to do that than to, you know, try to, you know, achieve or maintain a peace it's mm -hmm. it's easier to subjugate people than it is to come to terms with them mm -hmm. yeah peace peacemaking is never glamorous it's not as sexy as war those nazi uniforms are going to get you laid those hippie peace uniforms well they'll get you laid but and then they'll get you hung <laughs> yeah so and not in a good way peace is not necessarily as sexy as war but I guess we, we all have to turn to Jesus, the Lord of Peace, to teach us how to be sexy again. Oh, speaking of Sar, the Sar Shalom. Do you have a blessing for the Tsar before we go? Yes. May God bless and keep the Tsar far away from us. L'chaim. L'chaim. Can we end this? I should have just ended. I shouldn't have asked. I mean, you could always clip it out after. No, I don't think so. I think it's just going to be a bit now. All right.